This happened last spring. My cousin Jimmy and I were going camping. You see, we live in Arkansas. I know a lot of people like to talk a lot of smack about our state, but realistically, it's quite beautiful and nice, and a great place to call home. It was a Saturday night. We only planned on doing a one-night sleepover as we wanted to get everything set up and got home by Sunday. We got there real early. We got the tent set up, all the meat prepped, everything was laid out on the picnic bench, and I cleaned off the grill from whoever was out there before. They left it a mess. It was disgusting. Fast forward into the night and about a 12 pack of Budweiser later, we were feeling quite good, plus we ate like kings that night. So we were just jamming on to some country music, just enjoying ourselves. We decided just to call tonight at about 11.30, we figured we might as well get up early to cook some breakfast on the grill. So after we packed everything up, well, mostly at least. Everything meat-related and everything was stayed in the cooler outside. We got in our tent and probably talked for another about 15-20 minutes of some drunkenness, and we finally passed out. I don't know what time it was, but I had woken up to some weird sounds outside of our tent. I looked over to Jimmy and I noticed he was already awake. His eyes were wide open, but he was in total silence. I motioned to say something, but he just hushed me with his finger across his lips. Shh. I didn't make a sound. I just laid there and listened. Damn it, Jimmy! I'm sorry. Shh. I couldn't hold it anymore, he said, whispering. Were you just making those sounds up? I asked. No. There's something outside. Oh, come on. Come on now. I'm serious. Look. He pointed behind me. I turned around, and I saw the shadow of something peering in through the moonlight. Whatever it was was hunched over, but it looked too tall. It was definitely taller than me, I'll tell you that, and I'm 5'11". It started making these grunt noises. Something that I've never heard of before. It was... it was wrong. It didn't sound like anything that we've ever hunted before, I'll tell you that much. It scared the daylights out of me. I swear, I couldn't move. I was so scared. I was desperately trying to find my gun and my jeans that I had folded up in the corner of the tent without trying to make any noise. It's not that easy without using a flashlight, of course. I eventually found it, checked it, and then I slowly walked over towards the zipper. I swallowed a gulp of whatever courage I had left. My cousin just nodded at me and just kind of gave me the approval to, you know, go for it, I guess. I slowly and as quietly as possible unzip the tent at least halfway, enough for me to squeeze through and check my surroundings before fully hopping out. I was shaking in my boots, and I was barefoot. That just goes to show you how frightened I was. I slowly stood to my feet. I glanced around with my pistol, but I didn't see anything. But I heard it. I heard the howling of Something very close by. Shortly after that noise, whatever you want to call it, there was no coyote. I started hearing these heavy footsteps. I could feel the vibrations beneath my feet. Whatever it was, was big and it was close. I quickly turned around to look at my cousin Jimmy. He was halfway out of the tent. I started walking around the back of the tent to see if whatever it was may have been on the other side. And that's when I saw it. This beast of a man, whatever it was. It was on the edge line of our spot where we were camping. 
We've been hunting our whole lives, yet I've never seen this before. Just imagine a giant coyote, one that's pure black that stands like me, hunched over at least six feet tall, and full of fur, and full of fangs. The craziest thing about it was its eyes. Its glowing, amber-like eyes. It was as bright as the moon, or even more. It glared at me. It knew I was looking at it. I aimed. I got one shot at it. I don't know if I hit it, but as soon as I pulled that trigger, the damn thing was gone. My cousin quickly joined me. I explained everything that I saw to him, but... He's still in disbelief. He just thinks that we were drunk. Which is not necessarily a lie. We were definitely out there. But... I know what I saw. I just can't explain... What it was. My wife and I were camping this past weekend... This is something I just need to get off my chest and just lay it out there. I'm sick of holding it in. It was around 5 p.m. Maybe it was 4.30. I don't recall, to be honest. She was cooking on the grill. She was grilling up some of those marinated flat ribs that you could get from the Mexican market called Primo's out here where we stay. It's so amazing. It's perfect. I had a six-pack of Corona Extra, and of course, she only had one. She's pretty much a sipper. That leaves five for me, which was plenty. I didn't want to get hammered, I just wanted to feel good for the evening. The only issue was, I didn't have any cigarettes. Now, I'm not a smoker, but when I drink, I enjoy a couple cigarettes. I guess it's pretty common for a lot of people. Not everybody, I would say, but typically, a lot of non-smokers do smoke when they're drinking. Ah, uh, enough of this puff puff pass talk. Let's get back to business. So fast forward one of those Bluetooth speakers and we were jamming to some old 80s, maybe early 90s Latin freestyle music. You know, like Cynthia and Johnny O. You're my dream girl. Da -da 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 dream. You know, I can't sing. Don't judge me. Anyways, we were jamming to some oldies. Eating good. We had the beers. We even had a couple of those lanterns hanging up on neighboring trees near our tent and the picnic table. We were really just having a great time together, as we usually do. Until we went to bed. That's when all hell broke loose. We were, you know, doing, doing our, our thing. thing. Oh yeah! We were pretty loud too, but our nearest camping neighbor was probably about 40 feet away from us. Basically, a spot past the one next to us as we had some gaps in between us. For some reason, it just wasn't packed like it usually was. That place is pretty popular, too. Not that I'd ever go there again, that is. So, regardless, we were making up as much noise as we wanted to because we felt like nobody could hear us anyways. But that's when we, we heard it. We heard something... Whatever that thing was, it sounded like it was right outside of our tent. Now mind you, I don't own a gun. It's not that I don't believe in them, but we're in California and it's like, basically if you shoot an intruder, the intruder will sue you and they'll win. That's just the way it is. Our state sucks. All I had was a bowing knife. That's it. I thought that's all that we would ever need. You know, if we come across a snake or a little coyote that won't go away. This wasn't a coyote. This sounded huge. Its vocal tones were deeper than mine. And I'm a grown-ass man. But this wasn't a man. I don't know what it was. All I know is that we both sat up in our tent as quietly as possible and held each other, looking around, not knowing if the shadows that we were seeing were actually shadows or the shadows of this thing. My heart was beating so hard in my chest, I swear it was going to break through my rib cage in the sternum. 
I was completely terrified. It wasn't a bear. It wasn't a coyote. We don't get wolves out here. I don't know what the hell it was. My wife started sobbing, and I just put her head in my chest. I just whispered in her ear, Just keep quiet. Whatever it is, it may just go away, or maybe it's just hungry and it just wants our ice chest. Deep down inside, I knew I was really talking to myself. So we waited. We waited, which felt like an eternity. Realistically, it was probably only about 20 to 30 minutes. Constantly, this thing would just pounce back and forth. Its footsteps would vibrate around us on the dirt floor. Whatever it was was big. Bigger than us. A lot bigger. It sounded pissed. I heard whatever it was outside destroying everything we had set up outside. I could hear it throwing all of our equipment around, and then... the ice chest. First, I heard the lid rip open. Then I heard all the bags and all the things being thumped around and... gnawed on. This thing was eating everything we had. We had lots of stuff that we had prepped for morning breakfast. We were gonna eat like kings. We had sausages and steak and bacon. We had the works. We were gonna get our grub on. But that obviously wasn't gonna happen. My wife started to sob some more. Then she was having a panic attack. But realistically, it was due to her asthma. I gave her her inhaler, and she inhaled two puffs. And that's all it took to give away our position to this thing. How do I know this, you may ask? Well, because it stopped whatever the hell it was doing out there with our crap. At that moment, I looked directly at it through its reflection from the vinyl tent wall. I could see the dark silhouette of this giant canine-like human. I never truly saw it. I never peeked through the zipper. All I could see was its glowing eyes through the vinyl. The glowing amber eyes staring right through my soul. The chase. My heart felt like it was going to burst. I couldn't stop running. If I stop running, I'll die. Fuck. Fuck. Fuck, it is gaining on me. I... I left my boyfriend behind as food for the bees. The... Wolf... Dogman... I don't know. Was it a werewolf? I didn't have a choice. My boyfriend's skin had already been loudly torn off, followed by an arm and a leg. He screamed loudly and pleaded with me to run. The sight of the blood. All that blood. I... I wish I hesitated or tried to help. As soon as the words were out of his mouth, I turned and ran as fast as I could. The last sight I saw of him was his head being ripped clean off and the burst of blood into the air. That... all that blood... I had to get out of there. I turned and ran away as fast as I could. The... wolf... man... whatever... well, he didn't seem so bad when we first met him. We asked him for help. Did he have any spare matches or anything? He was so friendly, so... kind, and invited us to stay near his cabin. We're new to hiking and camping, real city slickers, and we're happy for the help. My mum always hated camping. 
and always tried to keep me away from the woods. I've... I've always been drawn to them. She never said why. She was right. I never should have come here. I could hear the howling behind me. How could such a mild-mannered man turn into such a beast? Everyone heard of the werewolf legends. His eyes changed. The formerly mild-mannered former librarian had black fur burst from every part of his body. His muscles swelled and into those savage jaws my boyfriend lost his life. I look back into the darkness and see those glowing yellow eyes always getting closer. <sighs> my lungs, they felt like they were going to burst. I leaned with my back against a tree, hunched over and panting. I couldn't let him take me. I couldn't let him change me into something I am not. The wolf was gaining ground, almost mocking me. It could have killed me at any time. What was it doing? Finally, I fell. I sobbed and cried, trying my best to crawl away. I could hear it behind me. The breath of the beast as the moonlight allowed it to cast a shadow down over me. My stomach twisted. My chest was tied. I could hear it behind me. I simply could not go on anymore. Every muscle burned. Every limb ached. I, w I was sure I was going to have a heart attack. I looked up into the sky. It was so different from before. I realized there was a change in me. You can never deny who or what you are. I threw away my glasses. The sky changed. The moon was so bright, so perfect. Da da! I. I could understand him? You can never deny what you are. You can never deny who you are. There's no point in trying. My body began to morph. Muscles bulged as fur roughly pushed from my skin. My clothing ripped and I could not resist howling at the moon. Behind me, the wolf man. My father brought the corpse of my boyfriend over and I sank my teeth into him ripping his mangled body even more apart. I was home. I was finally home. The Dark Man I met my best friend Ben when I was 19. We started a degree in music together and had absolutely nothing in common which we loved about each other. What shocked us was how sync our childhoods had been. From being born two weeks apart to the age of 12, we shared a lot of experiences, even though we never met. I remember Ben telling me about a VHS he used to have with Huxley Pig and Will Quack Quack cartoons on it, saying how obscure it was and how he loved it. I replied that I knew exactly which VHS he was referring to, and also stole a copy of it. This sort of thing happens a lot between us, so we like to quiz each other from time to time, then joke about how different we were from our identical upbringings. One night I was staying over at Ben's house. We got on the topic of kids' ghost stories. I love creepy stories. But Ben hates them, so the conversation was slow, going at first. We started with the usual stories, kids in the neighborhood spread. 
It was funny how many of our town's stories were exactly the same, for being opposite sides of the city and the river. They're miles from each other. The dilapidated places were always haunted. We had both heard about the one-eyed black cat, nobody owns, that watches the children play out. The list of stories went on and did have similarities. Ben got surprisingly into the discussion. So, have you heard of this story? Exits, to which I confirmed all told my town slightly different version of the story. That's how the night progressed, after we exhausted the conversation he ended with. Even to this day, I'm still scared of the dark man. So please tell me, have you heard that story too? I just remember being dumbfounded, saying I had no idea what the dark man was. As far as I'm aware, the dark man's story is in Ben's town. We tried looking on the internet, but Ben was too easily freaked out by the pictures and scary stories that popped up as we searched. The dark man really grabbed my attention. Usually, kids' ghost stories go into so much detail like the color of the ghost's dress, or the exact way the hair hangs off the ghost's eyes. But there wasn't much information about the dark man. The details were vague. His words at the time were something like, the older kids who were allowed out on the streets told us about the dark man, who stood around in the alleys at night, and the older kids were shamelessly scared to go there and it got dark. Obviously, it was thugs or druggies, I explained. But he was adamant. No, because they ran away when they noticed the kids watching them. They climbed up the high walls of the back alley, into people's backyards, very fast, without making a noise. The older kids wouldn't talk about it, unless pushed. He said the feeling seemed too real to make a joke, to scare the younger kids. His childhood friend Wes claimed he saw one too. The story goes to the dark man, who would be found standing in small groups, or more often solitarily, in the middle of an alley, looking for scraps of food, not doing much else. Ben seriously thinks he saw one with his mom one day, walking back from the shops. Apparently, it was in a fenced-off area where the block of flats had been demolished a few years earlier. At the opposite side of the land, he saw a skinny, hunched-backed man cupping his hands full of water from a steam which ran through the plot, washing his long greasy hair almost ritualistically. Even though he didn't see the homeless man's face, he was quite far away to make out details. He swears something about the man wasn't quite human. I blamed the child's imagination and memories, but he swears it. He showed me the area that next morning. If he and his mother are remembering correctly, I have no idea why even a homeless man would wash his hair in a dirty stream. I first met Wes a few weeks after the night I learned about the dark man, and didn't hesitate to ask for his first-hand account of the dark man. It was the main reason I decided to meet him, after all. His description was similar to Ben's, but his encounter was far more close up. Wes lived further from the local corner shop then Ben and used to take a shortcut through an alley when he walked there. The wheelie bins were out that day. He said he could hear a cat or dog feeding on the discarded food behind one of the bins. It happens a lot, and everyone knows to keep a distance so the dog won't get aggravated and attack. But Wes said the dog didn't look right. He only got a quick glance before it ran behind a wall with a rotten roast chicken hanging from its mouth. According to his memory, it was running more like a hyena 
than a normal dog, with its shoulders held much higher than its hips. The snout was too short, and the ears were more elfin than a dog's. He can't remember if the creature had fur on us, but it was definitely naked. Not long after, he overheard the older kids talking about the dogman and realized what he saw. I like Wes, but he has doubting attitude akin to me, and admitted his story may have been influenced by other kids' stories. It could have been a normal dog struggling to carry a whole chicken away after being startled. The story lay dormant, not mentioning for months after I spoke Wes. In that time, I had moved away, and have only managed to visit Ben three times since then. The last time I met with him, we decided to go to the local takeaway in the early hours of the morning, and I got my very own encounter of what could have been a dark man, right on the same abandoned plot where Ben saw the homeless man bathing. There was a decent side fire burning. It could have been possibly three silhouettes huddled around the flames. Ben's area is pretty rough, so it isn't an unusual sight, but I don't know how to describe it. Those figures weren't moving naturally. My view wasn't great, because Ben wouldn't move closer than we were, but I swear, those silhouettes never stood completely upright. We watched them for about five minutes. They were hunched over with their backs to us, warming their gloves behind the fire with the hoods up. I remember one of them moving closer to the fire while keeping its hands on the ground. It could have been easier just to stand and walk closer, but it shuffled awkwardly using its arms. Everything about their movements was indescribably awkward. I was so excited. It had to have been a dogman. I didn't want them to spot us, so we left pretty soon after. But I forced Ben to visit the bonfire with me the next day. There was just a milk crate set next to the charred circle on the ground. Nothing to prove these beings were inhuman. Strangely, there were bones in amongst of the smoldering papers and branches that had been burning the night before. We could make out to the handprints, where at least one of the homeless people had presumably crawled directly over the charred ground. The trail of handprints led away from the bonfire and faded after a couple of meters. That was all we found. We walked away, feeling slightly silly, laughing at how we'd probably been stalking a trio of drunk tramps. However, Ben's realization unnerved us terribly. As the hand trail faded, he pointed out a large paw print becoming more and more prominent in the middle of the fading handprints. Then it struck me why I found a gate so weird the night before. As a man had walked closer to the fire, he placed his feet exactly in the same spot his hands would have been. We stared in shock, not sure what to make of the trail. Then the yelps and growls of dogs fighting came from a bush uncomfortably close to us. I'm not ashamed to say we ran away, crapping ourselves. Maybe it was just a pack of dogs. We didn't care to look, and I'm never going back there to find out. So the officer and I went out there to... to take a look at it. And you know... He just tried to chew in around the doors. And you could see a dog print outside on a window there, so you know it was obviously a dog.
Somewhere in the north woods darkness, a creature walks upright, and the best advice you may ever get is never to go out at night. A very strange thing happened after the poem was aired on radio on April 1st, 1987. And it became obvious the story was not going to fade away. The first two times the song was played, there was no viewer reaction or calls. Cook and O'Malley were prepared to let the failed prank die when the phone lines started lighting up. People were calling in asking about the weird song. Listeners asked, who did that song on the Dogman thing, and when are you going to play it again? O'Malley took a call from an elderly man who stated that he was chilled to the bone after hearing the song because he had actually seen a similar creature years before. That was the first of many sighting reports that would pour into the station over the next few weeks. Scores of people told the stories and encounters with a creature that was very much like Cook's fabricated dogman. Within one month, The Legend of the Dogman became the most requested song on air and for a short time was added into the regular rotation of music. Other stories began to surface and be compared to the Michigan Dogman story. A century-old, mysterious Indian legend revealed shocking similarities. A French fur trader's diary from 1804 told of an encounter with Loup Garou. A letter from 1857 described a creature that stood upright like a man, yet bore the countenance of a gray wolf. A real dogman sighting investigated by Lake County Sheriff's Deputy Jeff Chamberlain who was accompanied by Department of Natural Resource Officer Ron McCarty, was picked up and reported on by Mark Marionette, a reporter for the Cadillac Evening News. Then other news sellers began to pick up the story, and it was later fed down the Associated Press Newswire, and thus was picked up by newspapers all across America. It was even mentioned as a strange coincidence in Paul Harvey's National News and Comments broadcast. McCarty called the TV station, WTCM, stating that he and Chamberlain had openly joked about how this sighting would fit with the seventh year prophecy made in that song. McCarty's voice would later appear in the beginning of the 10th anniversary version of the song, The Legend 97. Suddenly, The Legend soared into national prominence and became a hit song once again, only this time on a much larger scale. Requests for copies came in from all 50 states and all around the world. Eventually, the master tape never consisted of the real value. It had been destroyed, and Steve Cook went into the studio again, this time with an upgraded keyboard, and recorded the song a second time. A few changes were made to the lyrics to update the legend for the summer. When it was finished, the second mass recording was shipped to Southfield, Michigan for mass production. The first 500 copies arrived a week later, and sold out in just 12 days. The legend had quickly become a hot property, with record stores and radio stations across the country calling the station requesting copies. A large record company offered to record and promote the song and Steve Cook faced the difficult decision of whether to release the legend on a national scale or keep it local and manageable. Steve chose to keep it local. The music and lyrics were copyrighted by Mind Stage Productions, Cook's marketing and advertising company. More and more copies of the tape, which was originally priced at $3, were sold in the fall of 1987. WTCM held an art contest which allowed amateur artists the chance to submit works depicting what they thought the Dogman would look like. There were over a hundred entries. Some were exceptional, but by far the most chilling and dramatic was an 11 by 17 charcoal sketch done by Brian Rowinski, who was only 23 years old at the time and never had a formal art lesson. 
The song was never intended to be a marketable vehicle for profit, and Cook made the decision early on that any profits earned derived from its sale would be donated to charity. The first charity was the Traverse City Cherryland Humane Society, which scored $2,500 towards drilling a new water well and the remodeling of an adult dog facility, which included new floor and tiles and pins. In 2001, Cook was introduced to Brian Manley, founder of AC Paw, a no-kill animal rescue program that specializes in lost causes. AC Paw takes in animals that have been injured, abused, or neglected, or that have used up the maximum boarding time in traditional facilities and are about to be euthanized. They rehabilitate animals through a unique foster care network and eventually place them in a loving home. Cook was so impressed with the AC Paw program, he shifted all donations from the proceeds of the legend to their cause, and thus, the legend of the Dogman's legacy lives on for animals in need. While the legend has never been formally distributed for airplay on other radio stations, it's been heard across the USA and the world. Many young adults grew up hearing it and remember it scaring them at summer camp. The legend has inspired movies, screenplays, stage productions, numerous books, term papers, at least one master thesis, and countless classroom projects at all grade levels. In spite of the initial belief that the song would be a radio bit designed to run one day only, interest in the legend continues to grow. Steve Cook receives 10 to 20 reported sightings each year, many supported by dramatic evidence. Perhaps the best description of the legacy of the legend came from WTCM morning host Jack O'Malley. This song has been firmly woven into the fabric of northern Michigan. It's part of the culture now, part of the folklore. The legend will be here long after we are gone. The Gable Film In an estate cell, an old film was found in a box. After viewing it, a home video of a strange attack was discovered. The film shows a young boy filming normal family stuff, until a truck rides past a field showing a creature of some sort. They stop the truck and film the creature until it charges to attack. The attack is somewhat caught on tape and even shows the mouth of the animal. The mouth rules out ape or dog origin. Some people claim this is the dog man. Encounters Big Rapids, 1961 When I was a boy, my father was the night watchman at a manufacturing plant located in a rural area between Big Rapids and Chippewa Lake. Our house, which if I can remember right, was a perk of the night watchman job. It was across the street from the factory. The plant building was right next to it, with a large wilderness area of state land. At that time, it was simply known as Haymarsh, but, but now it's officially called Haymarsh State Game Area. We didn't understand it at the time, but Dad was always very skittish about letting us play outside after dark. He would sometimes talk about hearing coyotes or bears roaming around in the hay marsh when he was out walking the perimeter of the building at night. But then one night in the summer of 1961, Dad walked back to the house to sit on the porch and have a cup of coffee and a sweet roll. He had a good view of the entire plant property. He saw some movement near a chain-link fence behind the building. He said it was approximately 3 a.m., so he felt quite sure this person wasn't there by accident. So he drew his gun and he watched for a few minutes, and that's when he noticed there was not a person there at all, but but something much taller. He said it appeared to be covered by brown or gray hair. He had very broad shoulders and a powerful chest. It alternated between walking on four legs and standing up on two. He said it seemed to be looking for something along the driveway. He later said... He couldn't quite believe what he was seeing. He quietly moved into the house and grabbed his Kodak Signet 35mm camera, which was his pride and joy. At this point, I should mention that Dad was quite the photography buff. His father had owned one of the first camera stores in Ohio, and Dad got the shutterbug from Grandpa.
As he stepped onto the front porch, the creature moved slowly along the driveway, directly under the lights. He adjusted the camera for long exposure, held it as still as he could. He said he was shaking pretty bad by then and snapped a picture. I've enclosed a print in this letter. Dad said after a few seconds later, the thing dropped back down on all fours and slowly moved off into the woods. He sent a print to the local newspapers and sent copies to several magazines. One that, I think, was called Styrion published the photo in their spring issue of 62. Dad had a copy of the magazine for years, but, and, but it was misplaced after he left. still have the negative strip that contains this image. If you would like to have someone examine it. I also still have Dad's Kodiak signet. I haven't shot any pictures with it for several years, but pretty sure it still works. Sparta, 1987. One weekend back around fall 1987, my two best friends and I were staying at my family's cabin, which is not far from the small town of Sparta, about 20 minutes north of Grand Rapids. Anyway, my two friends left for dinner while I stayed behind in the cabin. Following the dinner, the two men headed back towards Sparta and the cabin. What happened next would shock and disturb them for years. It was dark, and they were on a rural world. It was dark and they were on a rural road. Suddenly both of them saw something standing by the side of the road. In the headlights of the car, it appeared to be a human-like figure covered in gray fur. As they got closer and passed the figure, both of them got a very good look at it. It was the size of a man, and it stood on two legs, but it was covered head to toe in gray fur and had a wolf-like head. It even raised its hands and seemed to snarl at them as they drove by. He said it looked like a werewolf right out of a Hollywood movie. My two friends didn't dare stop. They continued driving, and of course they were peppering each other with questions. Did you see that too? Was that a dog? Was that someone dressed up in a costume? And so on. As they were having this animated conversation, they passed the sign that says Welcome to Sparta and drove through the small town on Main Street and continued on out of the town in the direction of my cabin. The conversation about what had just happened continued when both of them looked up at the same time. Their conversation about what had just happened continued. When both of them looked up to see the same sign, Welcome to Sparta sign, again followed by the same main street that they had just drove through only moments ago. They hadn't stopped or turned around. They had been traveling on the same road in the same direction, but somehow, without any noticeable interruption in their journey, they had somehow been sent backwards several miles. Until this point, it would be easy to dismiss this as some sort of joke. However, the time displacement characteristic is what set this encounter apart. While such things are well documented in UFO and alien abduction stories, it's something we have not seen before in the Dogman sighting reports. I remember when they finally showed up at my cabin. They arrived no later than what I expected them to, around 9pm or so, and I remember how animated they were about their strange encounter, but I just assumed that they'd seen a large dog or were telling an embellished story to get a laugh, but 20 years later both of them still insist that this was no joke. I have no idea what to make of the story, maybe it was just some teenagers in a werewolf costume playing pranks, and did my friends really experience lost time afterwards? Or did they just make some wrong turns on their drive and didn't notice because they were distracted? I have no idea, but I would love to know if anyone else has seen similar things in the Sparta area. The area around Reed City, Michigan has been a hotbed of dogman activity. This report details an event that occurred nearly 20 years ago, but the witnesses remember it like it was yesterday, and is unshakable in her story. Her name is Courtney and her encounter took place during the winter of 1993-94. to Courtney was a teenager at the time and was sneaking cigarettes behind her parents' home near Todd Lake, northeast of Reed City. The sun was setting on a clear, cold winter day. 
Courtney was facing a large abandoned barn on the property next door. The barn always kind of spooked me. It was filled with rusty old equipment. The outer planks were all rotten and it sagged and leaned in every direction. My dad said to stay away as the whole thing could collapse. On that evening, I was standing about 50 feet from the barn and I saw sunlight coming through the gaps in the siding. Courtney took her eyes off the barn for a few minutes, then something caught her attention again. There was some movement. The light flickered, but I couldn't really tell what it was. Then it turned its head back and looked straight at me. It was at least six feet tall, if not more. It had a dark color, it had a dog-like appearance, pointy nose and ears, and it was really big. Courtney dashed into her house to grab a flashlight. When she returned outside, she shined it toward the barn door, but the animal was no longer there. She walked closer to the barn to look for tracks in the heavy snow. When she didn't see any, she realized the creature might still be inside, and ran back to safety near her house. She never saw the creature again. She later talked to a neighbor who had seen something, the size of a buffalo, but the shape of a dog in the same barn a few months before Courtney's encounter. The neighbor said she had been so frightened by it she was in hysterics for near days. Her father had taken his gun and searched the barn, but found nothing there. At the time of these events, neither of the girls had heard the legend song and did not know about the Michigan Dogman legend until years later. Waters Meet 1994. This report comes to us from an anonymous contributor who grew up in Cheboygan County, but spent many summers camping on family property in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. This encounter took place in an area of Watersmeet, home of the famous Paulding Lights phenomenon. Oddly enough, the Paulding Lights are also known as the Dog Meadow Lights. I was 13, I had just gotten some new rollerblades for Christmas, and since the main road where our property sits is paved, I couldn't wait to ride around. I went blading by myself and stopped to rest for a second. On this road the woods are so thick there's not much space between the road and the woods in most parts. And I remember seeing trees pushed down on the road that my dad said was done by bears. He was an avid bear hunter after all. But I remember not hearing any of your normal sounds of nature, not even birds. The air was still, and the sky was dark. I was decided to turn back when I heard a rustling behind me, and something emerged from the left side of the road. I assumed it was a deer, but I paused and made myself as quiet as I could so I could watch it. I slumped down on my stomach in the middle of the road. It was about 600 feet ahead of me. When I got myself settled in the road, I watched it. I realized that what I was looking at wasn't a deer, it was on all fours with gray or brownish kind of fur. At first I feared the worst, thinking a bear caught my scent, until I saw its outline and color, and I thought I was looking at a dog, but I realized the face was too primitive, like a fox or coyote, you know? At this point in my life, I had never seen a wolf in real life and was too far for me to even tell the face exactly. The Michigan Department of Natural Resources has always recognized that wild wolves still roam the Upper Peninsula, although they were thought to be in a very limited number, and only in extremely remote areas. It is conceivable that this witness was seeing one of these wolves, but then something very strange happened. It extended its front legs in the slowest, longest seconds of my life, it stood up on its hind legs and sniffed the air and walked for about five steps, then got back down on all fours and walked to the other side of the woods, and it just disappeared. I don't remember how long I laid in the middle of the road staring at the empty space. I saw this thing stand like a human. I remember my jaw hanging down as low as it could, but there was a pool of drool on the cement under it. When it finally clicked in my mind that 
perhaps I should rollerblade my butt back to camp as quickly as I could. The witness reports that while the creature never stalked or pursued him, he slept very little the rest of the night. He never told anyone about what he had seen, fearing he would be ridiculed. At the time of the sighting, he had never heard the legend song either, and would not hear it until 2004. He moved to Southern California in 2008, and has no interest in camping ever again. Alpina, 2001. My dad and I have a story to tell about our encounters with the dog man. My dad's story took place in the mid 70s. There was a cemetery behind the Alpena High School and a wooded area behind that. There are many trails that run through here, and in these areas, the place is called the Sandies, where all the young kids would go to party, you know? My dad and two of his buddies were in a canoe in broad daylight paddling from the Sandies to the back of the cemetery. The banks of the river are 10 to 12 feet high in places, and some trails run right through the edge. The three of them saw what looked to be like a big dog running behind them on the trail. They didn't pay much attention to it until they heard a splash. When they looked, it was swimming after them. It went from a dog paddle to the chest and front legs coming out of the water and waiting after them. They decided right then not to wait around to see what it was. Honestly, I thought it was BS at the time, and I'm still not even sure to this day it wasn't something they had been smoking or drinking. Then around 2001 to 2, I was leading some friends through the Sandy's trails. I used to like taking people out there without a flashlight and tell them that my dad's scary story to freak them out. The girls were freaked out before we even got into the woods, so I decided not to scare them that night. In the river are small, several islands connected by a small sliver of land. At that time, there were three such islands chained together, and I, and I took them through the last one, which was planted with pine trees and nice even rows. I was the first one back there, about 30 seconds ahead, when one of the girls got her foot hung up on something. As I was going back to help her, there was a spot where the trees made this sort of roof effect, which was really cool looking at night with the moon shining through it and all. I thought, at that point, that I saw something. I'm not sure what it was, but it sent me running at double time. When my buddy saw my face, he didn't say a word, he just followed, both of us dragging the girls behind us. When he asked me later why I came out in such a hurry, I told him it was because I thought I had seen something at the other end of the island, walking through the trees, and it was very tall, but not likely a human. He may not have believed me, but he never questioned it either. Look, I'm still not sure what I saw, but it could easily have been that I just scared myself with my dad's story and was seeing things, but I know this. I still don't like the dark. And even though I love hunting, I hate going out before the sun comes up during deer season. Menden, 2007. The sighting report is told secondhand by a brother-in-law of the witness. The witness is a prominent person in local government and wishes to remain anonymous. The situation started last Saturday night around midnight when he was coming home from a friend's house in Benazona and taking the way back home to Traverse City. He stated that while traveling down Cinder Road, several miles outside of the town of Benden, he observed a pair of eyes reflecting off his headlights ahead of him. Thinking that it was probably a deer along the side of the road, he began to slow down. As he got closer, however, he stated that the object was much larger and darker than a deer. He said by this time, he had slowed down to around 30 miles an hour, and it was at this point he was several hundred feet from the creature, but it still hadn't moved. As he approached further, he stated that the only way he could describe the creature was being similar to a very large and dark wolf. However, he observed that this thing wasn't on four legs, but but upright on his back two legs, near a roadkill deer. He estimated the creature stood a little over six feet tall and had very dark fur. He stated that by now, he was going slow enough to bring his truck to a stop in the road and observe the creature which had not moved even now and was still just staring at him. He told me that for a brief second he believed 
that the object was a giant stuffed animal that was put there as a kind of joke due to the fact that he had never seen anything like it in his life, and that was why he was able to drive up as close as he was without it moving an inch. He told me then, however, that before he could finish that thought, the creature then dropped to four legs and sprinted across the road and disappeared into the woods on the other side of the roadway. He told me that he stayed frozen in his seat for a minute solid wondering, in the middle of the road, just what the heck had happened. I had jokingly asked him if he had been drinking that night, and with a deadly serious face he stated, no, whatever that was, it was for real. As perplexed as he was that night over what he had seen, he was deathly afraid to go wandering into the woods to investigate further. He said that, using a flashlight, he observed an animal's tracks leading into the woods on the opposite side of the road and was fortunate enough that night to have his digital camera with him. He showed me a photograph of the paw print which appeared to be about 7 or 8 inches long. He had another picture of the same paw print where he had placed a shotgun shell into the middle of it for scale. He told me that he was lucky that the side of the road was so soft because he wasn't willing to go any further than two or three steps from the door of his truck to get a picture. I inquired if the animal had made any sounds before it disappeared and he said that he did not hear it make any noise, and if it were not for the picture, he would have thought he had just imagined the whole thing. I asked him if he could have seen a bear and he stated, absolutely not. He bear hunts every year in the upper peninsula, so he obviously knows what a bear looks like up close. Anyway, that's his story, so believe it if you like it. If I didn't know him as well as I do, and hadn't seen the pictures, I would have said that he was just out of his mind. I've heard the song and know some of the stories, but I always believed it was just for entertainment value. After this, though, I'm looking at it all under a whole new light. Fontaine, how long have we been doing this? I shift and press the accelerator, surging the 67 Impala forward, the enormous red woods lining the sides of Route 101 whipped by in a blur. Depends when you start counting. To be a wise-ass Morgana. I shoot a glare at the linebacker of a man sitting in the passenger seat. A long time ago, a nasty supernatural experience gave me low-level telepathy, but I don't need to read his mind to know he's using my full name just to get under my skin. Hell, I don't know, Maurice, about five years? He nods in agreement. And in that time, have I ever steered you wrong? Grudgingly, I shake my head. Exactly. He crosses his arms to acknowledge his victory. So believe me, you don't fuck around with a wolf man. Which is exactly what we're about to do. He shifts uncomfortably. Probably. Yes. You scared? Terrified. His coffee-colored face is deadly serious. You should be too. I roll my eyes. Wolf man. Why don't you call it a werewolf like normal people? He shrugs. Different things. Pretty wide variety of werewolves. Everything from Indian skinwalkers to idiots who sell their soul to the right demon for a belt or a ring. But what's the difference between that and a wolf man? Maurice stares ahead, but his mind is far away. Everything. Werewolves gain a wolf's instinct, but keep their human mind. They can change back and forth. Easy as taking off the magic doodad. Wolf men are a different animal completely. They look like humans most of the time, but they ain't. He turns to me, expression grave. Wolfmen are where the full moon comes in. Three nights a month, the human part is torn away, and what's left is the closest thing to death incarnate you're gonna find. Silver's the only thing that can hurt him, and even that barely. Try getting a kill shot with 800 pounds of fur, claws, and fangs trying to rip your throat out. He shudders. I've known guys torn to shreds trying to take down a wolfman. Close casket funerals, every one. But the worst is if you somehow manage to survive an attack. Maurice shakes his head. The stories have that part right too. You get bit, scratched, it gets passed to you. Happened to a guy I partnered with a couple times, the name of Pat Campbell. Found out he put a silver bullet through his skull not long after. Seems a little dramatic to me. Yeah? He raises his eyebrows. Fontaine, wolfmen are a danger to everyone around them. The beast puts a rage in them, a bloodlust. Whole lot of battered spouses out there thanks to the mutts they're shackled up with. And that's where the moon ain't full. When it is, there's always a chance their loved ones will accidentally stumble on them in the wolf mode. Imagine waking up to find the people you most care about torn to bloody pieces by your own hand. Pat had a wife, three kids. He knew what had happened one way or the other. 
Figured it'd be less painful for everyone if you just ended things before I did. Maurice looks at me. Is that what you call dramatic? My only response is to edge the speedometer needle further to the right, the afternoon sun beginning its low descent towards the horizon. Maurice falls silent and leans back in his seat, point made. It's getting on towards six o'clock when I finally feel the mental tickle I've been waiting for. Here. Maurice sits up as I guide the car to an off-ramp onto the broken asphalt of the local road. Maurice says nothing, experienced enough with my clairvoyance to trust my judgement. The redwoods seem even taller as we continue, their gargantuan height blocking out the waning sun and trapping us in a kind of artificial twilight. After a couple of miles, a worn, single-story building appears around the bend. A weather-beaten sign out the front naming it Lou's Place. My telepathic pings flare, so I pull into the gravel lot and kill the ignition. I close my eyes and concentrate, reading what I can from the structure. A blood-red cloud engulfs my vision as the sweet scent of prey clings to my nostrils. An orb of brilliant silver shines bright overhead. It calls to me, and I drown in its song. Yeah, this is the place to start. We sure there isn't a history around here, Maurice? Nah, Morg. Not much of one, at least. Past few years, I've had a few unexplained deaths around the time of the full moon, but no pattern. Not like the last six months, anyway. A rash of killings have attracted us out west. Over the last half year, every full moon has brought more bodies, every one horrifically flayed, mauled, partially eaten, violated. Almost 50 spread over as many square miles of Humboldt County. The local authorities don't know what they think, but Maurice and I have a pretty good idea. Well, let's see what Lou could tell us. I step out of the car, my heavy boots crunching in the gravel, dark hair rippling in a light breeze that carries the invitingly earthy smell of the surrounding forest. Maurice follows close behind, his large frame and imposing presence. I don't need him, but it's nice to have backup when the going gets crazy. Maurice places a hand on my arm as I reach out to touch the door. Remember, Morgan, no matter what we get here, tonight is strictly recon. It's a full moon, and if it is a wolf man, anything more would be suicide. Got it, you big baby. Now stop worrying and let's get to work. I shove past him and push my way inside. The tap room is as dingy as I'd expected, and completely lifeless save for the old man tending the bar, absently wiping its chipped surface with a stained rag. I saunter up and perch on one of the stools, Maurice lowering his bulk beside me. The bartender gives us a look, first of surprise, and then concern, before quickly hiding it behind a mask of seeming nonchalance. Will it be, darling? I resist the urge to roll my eyes and glance over the unimpressive line of half-empty bottles behind him. Bourbon. Double. Rocks. Whatever's cheap. He nods. New big fella? Just seltzer. Lime, if you got it. The man moves to fetch the drinks. He's nervous about something. Anxiety practically sweating off of him. I lean into the bar. Lou, is it? He nods almost imperceptibly. Ice clinking softly in the glass as he pours. Been here a while? Uh, yep. Gone on about 25 years now. Huh. Long time. So what do you know about wolf men, Lou? I mentally pick up a shot of sheer panic rip through the man an instant before the glass shatters on the floor. I'm actually surprised how well he keeps his composure as he turns back to us. You need to leave. I throw him a winning smile. Lou, my man, you leave all the ladies this unsatisfied? Get out. His face cracks, the fear behind his eyes pouring through. Please, you don't know what you're walking into, darling. I open my mouth to respond. Oh, I think I do. Come on. Maurice stands and holds me to my feet, pulling me towards the door. Hey! I awkwardly stumble outside, even the pre-twilight intense after the dim recesses of the bar. What the fuck, Maurice? Real subtle, Morgana. Whatever, man. Get off me. I'm going back. He lets me go. Nah. I'm pulling seniority. What the fuck? Maurice shakes his head. No point. We know enough. This guy is obviously involved with whatever's going on. You picked that much up from your first vision, yeah? I nod, reluctantly. Okay. Now, his reaction tells us the right on about a wolf man. We stick here trying to get more info, he might give it to us. Sure. Or... His eyes shift to the full moon slowly beginning to rise above the treetops. We could throw a wrench at things. So instead, we're gonna go ditch the car, get loaded up, and come back to see what happens. If nothing goes down because you already messed it up, but you can always question him later. His brow shifts. Any objections? 
I respond with a sneer, but stay silent. I know he's right. He smiles. Glad you're on board. We get in the Impala and I crank the ignition. The car sends up a spray of gravel as I throw it in reverse and peel out onto the road. After about a quarter mile, I spot a worn deer trail and turn into the wood line. Wordlessly, I exit the car. Maurice joins me at the trunk and we go about readying our weapons. Two silver-coated knives clip onto my belt, six inches long and carrying a serrated edge. I pull my long duster back to see the Smith & Wesson in the holster I'm wearing, the revolver loaded with 38 silver bullets I cast myself. Maurice has donned a custom leather bandolier. He situates a machete over one shoulder, the blade specially treated with silver, the same as my knives, and a double-barreled shotgun over the other. Extra silver slugs line the crossed belts wrapped across his chest. We exchange a nod and slip into the trees back toward Luz. Once we get inside of the building, we hunker down and wait for something interesting to happen. It doesn't take long. After maybe 20 minutes, an old junker screams down the road, pulls into the lot, and practically runs into the wall of the bar. An unremarkable looking man jumps out, stopping briefly to untangle himself from the seatbelt before ducking inside. I close my eyes and extend my senses. It's hard to pick up any precise thoughts from the man, he's so blinded by fear and rage. I do manage to capture the image of a woman, blonde hair and snarls, face red and ugly from crying, but nothing more. The man stays inside for maybe three minutes, muffled sounds of shouting reaching us, even as far away as we are, before he stumbles outside to the car and roars off back the way he came. I raise my eyebrows at Maurice, who shrugs. Come on. I pull my pistol free as we cautiously make our way to the entrance bar. Maurice rests his hands on the machete handle and steps inside as I follow close behind. Lou is sprawled out on one of the bar stools, several of the formerly half-empty bottles now completely drained and littered about him. I move to the old man. I never did get my bourbon. His quiet laugh does little to cover a sob. So sorry, darling. I went and drank it all. Knew the jig was up when you started asking questions. What's going on, Lou? Suppose it doesn't matter now. Reckon you were probably watching the place, saw my buddy Larry. Tried to call him, told him not to come. But he was already on his way here early on account of those bastards. He stops, finds a not quite empty bottle, takes a drink. Biker gang, call themselves Sons of Romulus, operate out of an abandoned pot grow a bit north of here. Outlaws, no regard for anything, always been a little off. The last few months they've been downright sadistic, abducting people, left and right. Everyone knows, everyone's too scared to do anything. Well, earlier today they took Larry's ex-wife right out of her kitchen. Neighbours in her 70s saw the whole thing, caught Larry, wish she hadn't. Takes another drink, kills the bottle. And drops it. He came here hoping I'd help get her back. I feel for her. Lacey's a sweet gal and God only knows what those fucks are doing to her, though I can probably imagine. Even bodies have been piling up. He sighs. <sighs> but even if I weren't so fucked up, I still wouldn't go. The sons, they're unnatural. Got nobilities. But even that ain't it. It's... He trails off, his eyes flicking to the pale moon shining brightly through the dirty bar window. The wolf. Maurice's voice is quiet practically a whisper. Lou doesn't speak, but the abject terror on his face is enough. Maurice moves to the door. Let's go. I rush to catch my partner as he steps outside. Hey. Lou calls after us. Hey, wait. I ignore the old man, Maurice's long strides practically forcing me to jog as he walks back towards the stashed car. What the hell are we doing, Maurice? Going to help that woman. And this Larry guy. Obviously. One of those bikers must be a wolfman. Maybe more than one. We know the direction of their headquarters, and with luck, your talent will be able to guide us in. Yeah? What happened to just recon tonight? Anything else is suicide, huh? Morgan. His look is pained. You know better than anyone what it's like to be helpless and trapped with monsters in the dark. Past terrors flash through my mind. Cold red eyes burn into my soul as I'm lost in a living fog. Memory shifts, and I'm lying paralyzed in a room of white, the sounds of choked screams echoing nearby. Damn it. Fine. In and out. Assuming Lacey isn't dead already, we get her and get gone. Agreed. And for the record, I think this is a stupid idea, and it's your fault if it blows up in our faces. You can say I told you so. That'll make me feel so much better when we're dead. Maurice smiles lightly. As long as you're happy. I only sneer in response. We reach the Impala and are back on the road in short order, moving in the direction we saw Larry fly off. We drive for a couple of miles, just enough for me to start hoping my telepathy won't pick anything up. 
when I catch the barest whiff of the oily, mental stench I've come to associate with malignant supernatural entities. With a curse under my breath, I shove down my better judgement and follow. Ten miles and several turns later, the scent is so strong it's nauseating. I pull to the side of the road and look to my partner. We're close. This is your circus, chum. What's the plan? Maurice pauses for a moment, considering. Lou mentioned an old plant grow, which means structures. Let's get eyes on and go from there. I nod, in agreement. We exit the car and move into the brush, continuing towards the source. The emissions are so overpowering I'm forced to stop and collect my bearings more than once. God, it's like someone opened a doorway to hell. There's so much pain here. I think of the mutilated bodies that have been turning up in shadow. We come to a break in the tree line overlooking a clearing that houses two buildings, one significantly larger than the other. Huh, no sign of Larry. You got a read on anything, Morg? I shake my head. No, too much negative energy this far out. Maurice grunts, understanding. You up to search? I nod. Yeah, should be able to manage a basic mental cloak. Besides, if you found Lacey, she'd probably freak out at your ugly mug. He smiles. Fair. I'd check the smaller one first. Looks like it's got a padlock. Might be where they keep the captives. I close my eyes, and concentrating at the space in the center of my forehead, take several long breaths. Is it working? Can barely see you. Just a ripple in the air. Good. Watch my back. Always. I move from the foliage and start cautiously towards the structures. The suns may not be able to see me, but who knows if they have alarms or booby traps rigged. To my surprise, I reach the smaller building without any sign of enemies. Maurice was right about it having a padlock. I've got a set of picks I'm decently handy with, but those will take time. Better to determine if Lacey's inside before circumventing the lock. But even this close, I still can't get a read on the damn thing. I move to the side of the building and spy a small, dirt-encrusted window. Taking the corner of my coat sleeve, I wipe away some of the grime to peer inside, and immediately wish I hadn't. The light of the full moon shines just enough to reveal the interior of the shed. Dozens of human skins, dried and hanging like leather. Damn it. Stifling the urge to vomit, I turn away, and hands only shaking slightly, move to the larger building that must have once been the grow house. Reaching it, I try the front door and find it unlocked. I pause to draw my pistol, taking a steadying breath, and softly push my way inside. The interior darkness swallows me alive, waves of malignant energy clutching and cloying. I take a moment to let my eyes adjust, and my breath catches in my throat. The inside of the grow house is one large room. Bikers lay sprawled asleep seemingly everywhere, on tables and chairs and even passed out in the middle of the floor. The mixed stench of blood and sweat and booze combined with the hostile mental energy assaults me and it's all I can do not to choke. Which one's the wolf man? Shouldn't he have turned by now? Can't tell. Everyone here looks human, more or less. Count my blessings. Cautiously. Ever so quietly, I pick my way through the drunken mass to the back of the grow house. There, separated from the main area, I find another small room containing a large, locked cage. Five feet in all dimensions. The lone occupant silently weaving in the corner is a match for the image I pulled earlier from Larry's mind. Lacey. I set down my pistol and ease the picks from my pocket, selecting one in a talk bar. So far, luck is with me. The lock is easy to trip and no one seems the wiser. I replace the tools and pick my gun back up, easing the door open. I grip my teeth at the slight squeak of metal, but the only response from any of the sons in the other room is a loud snore. Lacey sits up confused, and I can see she's been stripped naked. <laughs> Who's there? Her voice drops to a terrified whisper. P please don't hurt me anymore. I consider for a moment. Look, don't freak out. I drop my mental veil. To her credit, she manages only a stifled gasp as I shuck out of my duster. Lacey, my name is Morgan. My partner and I are here to help. I'm close enough to sense her emotions now, a sliver of hope cutting through the stink of fear. Here. I pass her the coat and she wraps it around herself. Oh, thank God. They're monsters. They change. Shh. I know. Quiet. We aren't anywhere close to being out of here. Keeping one hand on Lacey and the other on my gun, I guide her into the room of sleeping sons that seems to have somehow grown three sizes in length. This is going to be a miracle if we get out. No sooner has the thought passed than a biker rolls over in his sleep, tripping Lacey. With a shriek of surprise, she falls into a table, knocking several glass breakers to the ground, shattering. Pandemonium breaks loose. I grab Lacey by the arm and sprint towards the door. 
the bikers rouse from their drunken stupor more quickly than I'd have hoped, hooting and hollering as they chase after us. A gorilla of a man steps into my path and I shoot him in the head, brain and bone exploding out the back of his skull. I, aim my, I shift my aim and fire off two more shots, dropping a pair of suns. The group's mocking turns angry and several pull rings from pockets and slip them onto fingers, their forms shifting. In moments, the men are replaced by snarling wolves the size of malamutes. They flow in a pack formation around Lacey and I, yipping and barking as I waste the rest of my ammo trying to hit them. I drop the gun and draw my knives, crouching in a defensive posture, doing my best to keep Lacey behind me. The wolves circle in, snapping and snarling. One of the still human bikers steps forward. Man, babe, you killed some of my crew. And you're gonna have to pay for that. He grins. Maybe like doggy style. The others laugh and howl in approval. Hey. His spoken word is quiet and calm, but nevertheless reaches the whole room. All of us, human and wolf alike, look to the door. Whatever we expect to find there, it isn't Larry. His slight naked frame standing in the entrance. That's my wife, you fucksticks. Beside me, I feel fear explode from Lacey at the sight of her ex-husband. The light of the full moon shining on him, the pieces suddenly fall into place. Oh, fuck. Where the werewolves change seamlessly, Larry's transformation is the stuff of nightmares. He screams as bones crack and rearrange, his face elongating into a fang-filled cavern of razor-sharp teeth. We watch as one, mouths agape as the change completes. The beast stands to his full height, towering above us, yellow eyes emitting nothing but hunger and rage. And then, the killing starts. The wolfman flies into the bikers as they try to escape, his claws opening flesh with every thrust of his massive paws. One of the werewolves leaps at the monster's throat, but Larry turns and catches the attacker's head in his enormous jaws, its skull popping like a grape. It's over in an instant. It takes me a moment to realise that, besides the bikers already dead and those quickly bleeding out, somehow Lacey and I are the only ones left with the creature. With a snarl, Larry leaps at us. Too stunned to move herself, I tackle Lacey to the ground in a panic, a glancing blow from the wolf sending us spinning across the floor. Desperately, I throw myself on top of her and try to pull a mental veil over us, unsuccessfully. I scream in defiance, brandishing the knife I've managed to keep hold of as Larry regains his balance and charges with a roar. The gun blast behind me is deafening, the silver slug punching through the wolfman's chest and dropping him to the ground with a whimper. The beast tries to regain his feet, but Maurice calmly steps past me, points the barrel at the monster's head, and puts a second round through his eye. I gingerly push myself to my feet, examining the carnage around me. Nice shot, I pause. Thanks. Maurice nods in acknowledgement as he reloads. I spy my dropped revolver and retrieve it, taking my partner's cue and reloading. Maurice moves to Lacey where she lies unconscious. I hear him inhale sharply. Morgan. I look where he's pointing, see the deep furrows ripped into her shoulder by Larry's claws. Sorrow, quickly followed by an icy rage, fills my chest. Damn it. I can only consider a moment before taking my revolver and putting it in her limp hand. Morgan, what are you doing? I shrug, giving her an option. I indicate the massacre around us. You didn't feel it. She was terrified, Maurice. Like you said, you don't fuck around with a wolf, man. I stand and move to the door. Come on, let's get out of here before Lou finds the balls to call the cops. And oh, I look at my partner over my shoulder. I told you so, asshole. Fighting bitter tears, I walk out into the night, the light of the full moon guiding my way. Well... I hope that everybody enjoyed the six Doggy Dogman World stories tonight. I simply had some perky ones, if you know what I mean. Make sure you stay close to the fire, toast up those buns, and we'll see you next time. If you like the narrations, be sure to check out my friends. Their information will be in the description box down below. Stay safe. And stay alive. Oh, my God.